Good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. My name is Nora Valenzuela. I'm the chair of the World Affairs Council of Orange County. And on behalf of the Board of Trustees and Executive Board, I wish to welcome all of our guests, uh, our loyal members, trustees, and also our distinguished uh, speakers for this afternoon. Um, we are very fortunate to have um, uh, individuals that come with great experience and knowledge and Dr. Downey will be providing you a bio so we can become familiar with um, their background and experience they'll be sharing with us. Um, please note that our events are um, nonprofit, non uh, we're a nonprofit organization with nonpartisan um, presence. So our conversations remain as an educational entity and angle, and we try to be fair to all sides of the topics and information. Um, we thank our speakers for coming all the way from wherever they are virtually joining us. And we also have guests joining us throughout from throughout the United States. So we will be providing the information for ordering the books. And if you wish to learn more about the topic um, at the end of the program. With that, I welcome all of you. Thank you for joining us and supporting us financially because this is the only source of income we have, the support that comes from our audience to bring such a distinguished speakers to you. I'm going to turn it over to my colleague, Dr. Downey, Colonel Downey. Sir, please introduce our distinguished speakers. Thank you. Well, thank you very much, Nora. And it is a, it is a real pleasure uh, for me to moderate this session, uh, particularly with our two very distinguished speakers, Jack Devine and Jonathan, Dr. Jonathan Ward. Um, let me introduce both of them before we start our conversation. And, and let me also uh, mention to our audience, we want you to be part of this conversation. Uh, as Nora said, please uh, submit your questions anytime down in the chat box. But uh, let me first in, uh, introduce Jack Devine, uh, who, is, uh, who spent more than 30 years, 32 years in the Central Intelligence Agency. Uh, he received many awards for his uh, distinguished service there. Uh, but I think the most telling thing is the last job that he held at the CIA. CIA which was the acting deputy director for the overseas operations, CIA's operations uh, out of the United, outside of the United States. And if you're not familiar with how the, the, the structure of the CIA works, uh, that role that Jack had made him basically the spy master for our country. Uh, and, and he was uh, responsible for uh, supervising the planning, organizing, and the conduct, the implementation of operations by our spies uh, throughout, the, throughout the world. So uh, I, I know he's got a lot of stories to tell about that and we look forward to hearing those from Jack. Um, he's, uh, he's also published a, 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 a book and that's exactly the title as you would expect, Spy Master's Prism, the fight against Russian aggression. And unfortunately I don't have a copy, but Jack, if you'd like to hold up a copy, we'd love to I just happened to bring one along, just in case. <laughs> <laughs> there you go. There you go. And I want to do is point out, uh, this was taken many years ago when I was standing in front of the Kremlin. So I have better ties today than I have in this picture. <laughs> well, because I know we're in California. I'm not quite familiar with the, but, uh, the ties, the designs. <laughs> yes. And and um, so, and by the way, that will be, that a link to that book will be on our website. So after this, uh, you can, you can uh, go to that as well as Jonathan's book, which I'll ask him to hold up as well when we get to that part. Um, but uh, Jack has, uh, has uh, had tremendous experience. Uh, he's also a much sought after commentator and analyst on, uh, on intelligence issues, or, uh, as you might imagine. He's been on all of the key networks, radio, t television, contributed to all the most prominent journals and newspapers. So Jack, it's a real pleasure to have you with us. Uh, it's, it's great to be here. Thank you for the generous introduction. And, uh, and I'd also uh, like to introduce Dr. Jonathan Ward, uh, who is, uh, we're so pleased to have you. He's an internationally recognized expert on uh, China, US competition and on China, uh, China strategy which is something we, we look forward to getting to. He earned his PhD at the University of Oxford, speaks Russian, Chinese, Spanish, Arabic. So he's uh, uh, had a lot of, lot of experience, but you know, for unlike many academics, his experience is not only 
in uh, in the books. He spent 10 years uh, traveling around the world, China, Latin America, Europe, the Middle East, uh, and Russia, India, and uh, where he, by the way, he did his PhD on China, Ru India relations. So, uh, but he's had many interesting experiences doing that travel. I, I hope we'll hear some about it. Uh, some of those were to very controversial places, uh, conflicted places. He, he was in a truck caravan crossing Tibet. He was also on a, an Indonesian freighter that crossed the South China Sea where he had to pretend he was an Italian. You look kind of Italian, though. You could, I could see you could pull that off, but Jonathan. So it worked. <laughs> yeah, it worked. So, uh, but uh, Jonathan's also uh, a consult, been a consultant to the Department of Defense, many Fortune 500 country uh, companies, and has has been a speaker in many places on uh, on U.S. China global competition and Chinese strategy. And his recent book is titled "China's Vision of Victory." And if you wouldn't mind, Jonathan, holding that up for the audience, please. Here's uh, China's vision of victory. There you are. Good looking cover. And <laughs> it's uh, and again, our that the link to that book will also be on our website. So for this, but um, well, you know, uh, let me get started because I have a lot of questions and I know like many of our audience, we've been really looking forward to this, uh, this discussion to hear of your views. Uh, so, uh, but, but before we get into details in terms of uh, specific issues. I'd like to talk a little bit about strategy uh, and, and overall overarching views of this first. Uh, you know, the Biden administration recently put out their interim national security strategic guidance, which is the interim document that they're using uh, as, as the focus for uh, our strategy until the, the National Security Council actually puts out the national security strategy. And, and I am I apologize, I'm grossly uh, oversimplifying this, but essentially the way, what they're describing is that uh, th this administration is stopping the forever wars so they can focus on major power, power conflict against strategic rivals like China and, uh, and Russia. And I wanna ask you both, is this the right approach? Is, is, are we taking this uh, seriously or are there other things we ought to be focused on as well? Uh, Jack, do you want to start? Yeah, it's a great question. I don't think anyone's bothered to ask me that question. Uh, I wrote an article in the Wall Street Journal of 2010, and it was entitled The CIA Solution. And what it really was, was my view that we ought to be out of Afghanistan and we ought to be out of Iraq, and we should turn the page back to a period where we would go in CIA and serve the role uh, to find surrogates. And the surrogates, of what we really want to do is make sure we have people on the ground that were willing to fight and carry out a mission that was tied to our mission. And as you may know, Richard, I was in charge of the CIA program to drive the Russians uh, out of Afghanistan in, uh, in the 80s. And I was there when the Stinger missile went in. So I've always, I was of the view that we should go in and re reorganize with the Mujahideen. That's what we did with the special forces and brought down the Taliban. So I've, I've not been a big advocate of putting our troops on the ground in countries. I, I thought Iraq was a mistake. And I thought we went down the wrong path in Afghanistan when we went from the covert program, which brought the Taliban to put an army on the ground. It is a very and we can see this today, once you put an army in, you know, Colin Powell addresses it, you own it, you're in there. So I am happy that we are leaving. Now, people need to prepare themselves in the sense that I'm pessimistic about what's going to happen as we pull out of these countries. And so and the reasons we, we stay so long is no one wants to be the last person out and hold the bag of I lost Vietnam, I lost Afghanistan, and it's, it's a tremendous pressure. But I'm of the view that, you know, nation building, you know, you, we really shouldn't be in that business unless our interests are there or we're attacked. So I think it's a really tricky business, but I, I think, as I said, as long ago as 2010, probably when I was, you know, if you go back to the 
the 1980s, I was probably still of the same view. And that's why I'm an advocate of covert action and less about our military. And frankly, most of our generals are reluctant, I mean, wisely, because they know the cost, they know the pain of, of war. So I'm comfortable with it. That is not to say it isn't, it's going to, there's going to be a lot of pain in the process of pulling out and there'll be a lot of finger pointing, but I think it's long overdue. Oh, good. Thank you, Jack. Uh, Jonathan, how about your, your thoughts on, on that? Well, I think, I think it's an absolutely necessary shift in foreign policy and in many ways it's overdue. I mean, it, it, there is, I think, a great deal of discussion as to whether or not America's wars in the Middle East caused us to miss what was really happening um, with the rise of China, which I think is um, in many ways, one of the greatest um, foreign policy failures and, in, in, you know, the most consequential in, in you know, certainly in, in my lifetime anyway. But the idea that we thought that China was going to enter the world economy, create sort of stability in the world, become a partner, a stakeholder. I mean, people believe this in senior policy positions well into the 2010s. And instead, um, the Communist Party was really delivering on um, a very deeply held, um, enduring, uh, a set of ambitions which saw them um, rising to the top of uh, the international system, coming to return to, as they see it, their central position in the world and ultimately to dominate um, the international system. So that pro um, process has actually been um, in many ways at the heart of the, the broader Chinese revolution and the founding of the People's Republic in 1949. And we facilitated that for decades on end. And now um, we're paying the costs here. And I think there's really a, a strategic crisis that's taking shape as you add you know, China and Russia together as major power adversaries, but it's really China's potential to become the, the heart of the world economy, the largest economy, just the center of supply chains, the largest market, and then to use that as a center of gravity to then um, you know, build in military power, military um, you know, power projection capabilities to defend their overseas interests. I mean, this is all as they see it and, and really reconstitute sort of a, a 21st century um, you know, economic and military empire. I mean, that's where we wind up if we don't start countering uh, China in, in, in every serious domain. And I think the issue is you could have seen that 20 years ago, but instead 20 years ago, we had the entry to the WTO and essentially a, a very laissez-faire uh, approach to China since then that um, at this point has built up to, to um, a, a deep structural challenge to our entire um, you know, uh, world order. So, so we, we have to deal with that right away. Richard, you know, John, if, I could, me... Richard okay. if I could just add one note to make sure that I don't leave the wrong impression on the point. I'm not for pulling out of the, the rest of the world and just concentrating on China or Russia, even though both of us are speaking to those important subjects. I believe there's a role for us in, our, in protecting our interests around the world on a very selective basis, but it's done through what I would call covert support. So. I'm not talking about pulling back and abandoning the world where we collectively, where there's a consensus, and we were kidding earlier about bipartisan, bipartisan support about where our interests are. I'm not suggesting we avoid them. I, I suggest we do become engaged, but not, not with boots on the ground. So I, I don't know if I drew that point as clear as I would have liked to. Oh, well, thank you, Jack. I'd, I'd like to add to that if you don't mind, um, Richard, just that. Hey, 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 Jonathan, if, if you wouldn't mind, because I, I want sure. to ask you to follow up on a point that, that struck me about what you were talking about. Uh, and, and perhaps you can add, add on to that as well. The, uh, uh, you mentioned that you saw one of our greatest foreign policy failures related to China. And I, I just was, did you mean the fact that we thought that by allowing China into the WTO, the World Trade Organization, and, and expecting that they would become part of the rules-based international order that by that expecting that to happen was a failure or, or what what did you mean by the fact that that our approach to China was one of our greatest foreign policy failures? I think the engagement with China um, continuing the sort of Nixon Kissinger consensus well past the Cold War past Tiananmen Square which really should have been um, a factor and instead uh, most favored nation status came soon after that and eventually the WTO. I mean they're really um, you know nobody was was watching the the other side of this that they might not uh, wind up as being a partner or stakeholder. And it's funny because, you know, someone with a doctorate in sort of Cold War history of Asia, um, the Indians did the same thing uh, before the border war in 1962. Nehru said um, the balance of power in Asia, I mean, it's going to be much more dangerous if China is outside 
of the community of nations. So let's bring them in. They introduced them to all of the uh, new diplomatic relationships that India had established. And within a decade, they wound up at war with China um, and with China using all those relationships against them. So I think that you know, we risk doing the same thing. We've brought them into the world economy uh, regard, you know, without um, asking for, for changes in the political system. And, and perhaps um, even if we didn't have the tools to induce that, we should have been much more circumspect, I think, about what we were ushering in with the growth of essentially an unreformed uh, authoritarian system. So um, which, whose human rights abuses uh, persisted throughout that engagement period. And instead we managed to transfer our supply chains and do all the rest of that. But I wanted to just add to what Jack said earlier that I agree that this isn't about pulling out um, around the world and focusing on just two countries. I mean, we need a broad based US global grand strategy. Um, even China alone, I mean, we're gonna be dealing with China in Latin America and Africa in Southeast Asia and Central Asia. I mean, their strategy is absolutely global. Um, they may not, we like to say we're ally rich and they're ally poor, but they have comprehensive strategic partnerships all around the earth. And, um, and they are essentially the top trading partner for a plurality of nations. So we're already in a global contest. We're gonna need a global strategy, which means um, you know, very robust um, diplomacy, especially with the, um, the emerging world. Oh, good, thank you. I, I wanna get into some more of that later on, but before I do, uh, and Jack, you mentioned uh, Afghanistan, I wanna go there as well, but uh, be before I do, you know, I mean, the fact that this is the, a strategic rivalry that Jonathan just talked about, with China, certainly, and Jack, you mentioned with Russia, is there, uh, what do you think of the chances that, since these are our major rivals, strategic rivals, that, uh, at, that they would coordinate their efforts to make life difficult for the United States around the world? Well, first, let me point out that, you know, we were allies with Stalin at one point during World War II. So, Conditions make strange bedfellows, but they don't, they're not, the question is, are they long lasting, right? And in the book, uh, Spy Master's Prison, I know that the, we had a source inside the um, KGB office in, in uh, New York City in 2000. And when he came out in 2004, he said, and he was the deputy of the KGB, so he was knowledgeable to solve things all around the world. And we asked him, well, what, what were the ranking of threats? And he said, well, when I joined many years earlier, number one was the United States, uh, number two was NATO, and uh, number three was China. So that was Russia's when he first went in. So when he came out in 2004, you know, we asked him, well, what are the top three targets? United States, NATO, and China. What I'm trying to say is embedded in the, the history of Russia and China, they at different points in time have aligned themselves, but there are there is a huge gap between their interest culturally, economically, borders. So we may, it's in their interest to hug together, but uh, you know, I'm willing to bet that the number three target, probably the number two target on China is Russia, and that China remains the number three target on, uh, for, the, for the Russians. So, Yes, we're going to see that. We, we need to pay attention to it. If we can stop that from happening, all the better. But it's not a marriage, as they say, made in heaven. Mm -hmm. Oh, good. Jonathan? Um, I, I mean, I think that's right that on one hand, they, um, you know, they're united in a kind of, I think, conceptually coordinated um, anti-Americanism in both uh, Asia and the Pacific, which is very reminiscent of the Sino-Soviet um, sort of early days where Stalin said to Mao, um, you'll take Asia, I'll take Europe, now let's go do it. And the next thing that happened was the Korean War, which was essentially China's to facilitate. Um, so, so I think the, the coordination that exists today is, is on a sort of conceptual strategic level, but as Jack points out, they definitely don't trust each other in a world in which they didn't have, um, you know, if they weren't united around an opponent, um, they'd be against each other. So it's sort of a Molotov Ribbentrop type uh, situation, I think. Um, and, but I think on the other hand, I, th I think there's a little bit too much expectation that the Sino-Soviet split is destined to repeat, repeat itself. I mean, the, the sort of best uh, explanations of that have to do with um, you know, Mao not wanting to be the junior partner in a, in a Russia-China relationship and seeing himself as an equal, seeing himself as having openings throughout Asia, Latin America as um, you know, colonial empires were rolling back across the world. And you know, the situation today is, is absolutely different with Russia 
um, as the junior partner, as um, a country that's at this point really been cut off from the Western economies, except for um, you know oil exports, and and it's it seems like a poor choice for Russia to, in the long run, uh, become a sort of military appendage to China and a strategic uh, partner, sort of a you know Russia to the United States, what Pakistan is to India um, when it comes to security problems. But that's good for China, and I think they'll probably want to keep that going. Um, and I think you know over time, hopefully, there would be the ability to have um, Russia sort of at least balance out as a more neutral party to all of this. I mean, their destiny is probably not a good one if they wind up uh, facilitating China's uh, you know, hegemony in Asia and ability to challenge the United States all over the world. Well, on this point, I'd underscore it that if Putin, if, when we get into, we'll get into that I'm sure later on, the psychology of Putin is not gonna let him be second fiddle the Xi. So there's built in tension there. It's just so out of his character to let that happen. But in the meantime, um, you know, they're going to be you know, partners of convenience. Yeah. You know, Jack, let's let's get into the psychology of Putin now. Uh, I mean, I, I think it's it's kind of interesting to me uh, to think, you know, analysts sometimes talk about Russia as this third rate country small economy. Yes, they have nuclear weapons, but uh, Russia, they, they paint this as if, you know, because of Putin's, I mean, quite frankly, I mean, he's a former KGB officer, clever guy, chess player. He played a very weak hand in Syria, Middle East and other places very effectively. You know what, but, uh, but they're really, so th their point is, eh, we shouldn't be that concerned about Russia. Uh, but what is, let's get into Putin's psychology a, a bit. bit. What, what does he want? What is he really trying to do? Thank it's you. A bit, it's a bit like the China syndrome, which is, uh, you know, you're, you're kidding yourself when you think about Russia as being an insignificant player. And that's why I was driven to write the book. The thesis is, yes, China is the great global military competitor challenge. But who is fooling around in the intelligence world and challenging us most aggressively and effectively, it's the Russians. So that's why Jonathan and I actually get together and talk. So there's a chapter in a book called The Spy Master President. And under it, there's a quote, and it says, um, there's no such thing as a former KGB officer, Vladimir Putin. So um, that is a key. And if, you, if I were speaking, I might say there's no such thing as a former CIA officer, Jack Devine. And what, I'm, what you're really talking about is a mindset. How do you look at the world? You know, and, and you have to go back and, and look at his psychology and his upbringing. He wanted to be a KGB officer at age 17. He was rejected for, because he was too young, but he got in and it, it was a very competitive. It's elite to get into the KGB. It's very difficult. And he got in and he did very well. He was in East Germany, which was a hot target for the Russians. That's where they were working with the East Germans that's where Marcus Wolf was, the famous East German spy. It was Dresden, I mean, dreary Eastern Europe. So, but that's where he was when the, the, the wall came down and his world fell apart. And he saw the dissolution, not only of the KGB, he saw it of the motherland. He is a true, to the core, uh, nationalist. So am I, so I'm not throwing a rock here. I mean, I understand Russian nas nationalism. So he was set on reconstructing whatever he did, wherever he ended up. One of the fundamental goals was to bring Russia back to a major power at the table. Now, when you rightfully point out, Richard, great, but you have the economy of Spain or Italy, right? Now, let's not dust off too quickly having nuclear weapons. But what he's adopted, and, I, and this is why it's so important to understand this, this mentality of his, he is executing the Cold War strategy. In fact, it was probably the Tsarist strategy. And that is, as I said before, you keep the United States weakened, right? You're the best you can. You take the Ukraine back because Russia without the Ukraine is a much smaller power. It's not an accident that he went into the Crimea and Eastern Ukraine. It's a fundamental thing. We didn't respond appropriately, in my view, because we didn't see it. And this goes back to Jonathan's point. I mean, we got so many other things going on in the world. We missed some of the big, the big plays there. So what did he do? He weakens all the countries around him. He probes in places 
where he thinks we have interest, Venezuela, mm -hmm. Syria, they always want a warm water port. So you're looking at someone using your very astute observation. He has a weak hand, but he's playing it masterfully. Where I have a problem is, I think it's a lousy strategy. Cold yes. War is over. You're not a communist yes. anymore. You ought to be in, the, in Europe. You shouldn't have sanctions. Let's not, uh, right. you know, end up on the wrong end of assassinating people. You know, I mean, uh, this is uh, this is a, a different era. So I, I think it's a great mistake. And the point that I wanted to make in the really heart of the book, when you look at cyber, and remember, we need to go there today, the most dangerous threat in the United States in cyber is, are the Russians, not the Chinese. The violation of not only going in and hacking into our country's systems, right? It's espionage, it's the world, we're used to that. But we had an understanding during the Cold War that we were not gonna meddle in each other's internal political affairs and causing and disrupting it, no matter what the movies show you, right? And we fought all around the world from Afghanistan to Chile, but inside after Stalin, the CIA was not mucking around inside Russia. And with very few exceptions, there was a one blip in the, the the Reagan period, where they fiddled around the United States. That's why it was a seismic, a seismic change, a change when they went in and used the information they collected to try and disrupt the election. Forget the candidates. They were meddling, and which was part of their objective, and their objective isn't hidden. It is the use of cyber disinformation propaganda to weaken your potential adversaries. And I think like Jonathan was describing China, because we were drawn in, and I understand how we got into it because of 9-11, we all know where we were and where we wanted to throw resources. But Russia went from being a 70% part of the intelligence budget to 10%. And I think that meant that we just weren't spending the time. And as a result of it, too many people dust Russia off and do not understand the, the seriousness of this threat and how dangerous it is to have a cyber war going on without rules. So let me cap it off there. I want to make make this this point loud and clear. Uh, Russia may may be the economy the size of Spain, but it is it's punching well above its weight, and we better we better respond in kind. Good. Well, thanks, Jack. Uh, you know, Jonathan, uh, we, so we talked a little bit about Russian strategy, uh, and you mentioned a bit about Chinese strategy. Uh, I'd like to get you to talk a little bit about that, but. Um, and perhaps in the context of uh, of where this is going, this, the Chinese strategy is going. And you talked a little bit about you, you were essentially talking about the uh, the Belt and Road Initiative uh, projects around the world, these strategic partnerships. But uh, about a month ago, we had a really great session. Uh, we the when I say we the World Affairs Council of Orange County with uh, Admiral James Devridis and Elliot Ackerman. Mm -hmm who wrote a book, uh, 2034. And that book, essentially, for those of you who haven't read it, uh, it's, it essentially is, it's a novel, but what they offer is a scenario based on current trends that leads to a conflict in which the US and, and China go to war. And, uh, and so I wonder if you could talk about, are we, is, do you see that trend moving in that direction? Or do you, um, uh, what is what is this, the Chinese strategy? What how does that encompass that? Thanks. Absolutely. I mean, Chinese strategy, I think it's it's useful because they've been absolutely clear. Um, you know, there's just so many uh, primary documents, and that's what China's vision of victory is based on, is essentially all the primary strategy documents of the Communist Party of China to just show for the reader precisely how they look at the future, how they look at the world, how they look at strategic industries at different regions. I mean, they've got um, you know, here they've got, here's our approach to Latin America, here's our approach to Africa, it's all just written down. And, um, you know, pulling it all together, you get a sense of what it is, and also its time frame. So it's, it's a strategy, I'll start with the ideological goals, and then I'll go into some of the underlying, um, you know, sort of tree trunk type uh, pieces of this. And, and, and first of all, it's called, it's essentially about what they call the great rejuvenation of the Chinese nation. And the idea is that China was humiliated in what they call the century of humiliation from 1840 to 1949, when the party, you know, founded the PRC, and, and that they're now going to restore um, their greatness. So at the, at the, the year 2049 is the 
100th anniversary of the founding of the People's Republic of China. And by that time, they will have essentially established themselves as the preeminent power in the world. Um, in order to get there, we're talking about a 30 year time frame, and it's broken up in five year plans and, you know, industrial policy documents and, you know, military strategy documents. But the basic pieces of it are um, military modernization, which seeks to, um, you know, build a, a, a military that is, uh, you know, joint operations, um, you know, second to none in space, cyber, uh, air, sea, land to pull all that together, um, to, to use that military to protect overseas interests. Um, you know, military modernization is one, then there's industrial strategy. Made in China 2025 is probably the most famous uh, document there, but it seeks mastery of 10 strategic industries um, from you know, electric vehicles to robotics, to biotech, to ICT. And if we think about things like Huawei, which is essentially Communist Party ICT going global with an infinite credit line, um, you know, that's how they plan to do that. I mean, having taken Western technology, they spread across the globe. Um, and then the Belt and Road, which is also on this sort of 2049 timeframe. And, and they say that by 2049, the military modernization will be complete. The Belt and Road will be complete. You know, the industrial strategies will be complete. So it all wraps up around then. And the Belt and Road shows the intercontinental geography, essentially, of a modern Chinese empire, where they've secured their resource, energy, food security needs um, through an intercontinental trading system in which they are the center. And it even, you know, it's not just uh, Europe and Asia. I mean, on one hand, it's a portal to, 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 to Europe, but it's also, it includes Latin America and it even includes space. It sort of becomes more and more expansive with every year. It includes the Arctic, the Arctic sea routes. So it's an absolutely global geographical vision that would be protected, if not dominated by expeditionary military capability um, and, and also uh, just pure influence. I mean, we already see in a world in which they are not the top economy, they are not the top um, military, their ability to exert economic pressure everywhere from Australia to, to Norway. So imagine the world in which they have surpassed the United States um, you know, economically and even militarily. And then you're getting to, to a world essentially of, un, uh, it's a vision of unending power. Um, and Xi Jinping has this uh, really significant quote where he says, backed by the invincible force of 1.3 billion people, we have an infinite stage for our era. So, so you can see like the grandness of this. And, and, and before, not to take up too much time on this question, but I wanna read something from Mao Zedong, which had never really been translated into English as far as I'm aware until this book. But um, he said in 1959 about regarding Asia and the United States, he says, all of the people in each West Pacific country don't understand why and with what reason the Americans from so far away come to the West Pacific countries using their military, political, economic, and cultural power to control these countries. Actually, it has no basis in reason. Therefore, sooner or later, America will certainly let go of the West Pacific and withdraw back home. Um, if the Americans don't go themselves, there will be a day when the people of each country will unite and throw them out. So this is before the Vietnam War. This is before any of that. Um, it absolutely, I mean, they've taken the United States as their primary enemy since the founding of the PRC. And, and I don't think that's changed a whole lot. I think the um, intervening engagement period was one that um, allowed them to rise as a modern um, scientific and industrial nation, but um, the U.S. was was the main enemy uh, in Mao's eyes at the beginning. That's why he formed his relationship with the USSR, and we're sort of back to the future now with Xi Jinping, and um, you know the animosity that, that the Communist Party certainly has towards this country. Uh, if I could just add something, Richard. Please, First please. of all, uh, I hope you bring me back in 2034 uh, because I'm going to make a, an intelligence forecast, which I rarely do. Right, so my, here's my forecast, despite what I said earlier. Russia and the United States will be, Russia will be in the West and aligned with us by 2034. Okay, so bring me back and we can test how, how accurate that is. Wow. Um, the second, well, that was very risky, 2034, let me tell you. But, <laughs> but the, second, the second point you said you were describing, you know, is war possible. And, and, you know, as far as I can see, I don't see that happening. I can see the potential for some kinetic interaction, particularly around Taiwan. But there's a big difference when both countries have nuclear weapons, how far how far you can go. But I was intrigued. I was reading in the, the New York Times of December of 1941. I was doing some research. And I was stunned by the amount of animosity that was reflected, I mean, on both sides, between the Japanese and the Americans. And uh, no, excuse me, it was, this, it was December of 1940. We hadn't gone to war. Uh, yet. So if you took the word Japan out and put China in, it's not dramatically different than the types of 
you know, discussions and points we're making. So I would say if there were nuclear weapons, I would be more in tune with your forecaster's view that the prospect of confrontation was you know, higher. I won't say high, but higher. Uh, so I, I do think we're heading down a path of increased uh, friction and tension. I don't think it would get the war, but uh, I, I, don't, I don't see an easy landing here. Well, you know, Jack, let me let me press for both of you uh, on that issue uh, of what that will, wh whether conflict will in fact go. And you mentioned Taiwan as the place that that could, you know, that could be the trigger, the catalyst. And, you know, in recent months, uh, we've seen not only this huge buildup of uh, of Chinese sort of modernization, particularly Navy, we'll, maybe we'll talk about this later, but what we've seen is incursions into Taiwan's air defense inter, uh, identification zone uh, multiple times. And it's been, it's, it's, it clearly is China baiting Taiwan. And I wonder if, if you see this being uh, signs that yes, we're, you know, China is building up the strength. They have the local uh, ability to do that where we don't have that kind of combat power locally uh, there, uh, you know, where, where that might lead to a a conflict, a, an invasion of Taiwan, or is this sort of the Chinese, you know, the, the, the uh, Sun Tzu's famous strategy, you know, winning without fighting is the acme of strategy. Is this just the way that they're, that the Chinese are, are saying, hey, look, look what we can do. And, uh, and rather than this could escalate to use the use of nuclear weapons. So just let this happen. In other words, they would win without, without fighting. Is this their way of doing this without escalation, or is this does this look like they would actually lead towards a uh, an effort to, to regain in their in their minds uh, Taiwan? Uh, Jonathan, I, I like to both sure. respond, but Jonathan, yeah, I, I think that um, on one hand, you know, many analysts have pointed out how difficult um, an actual invasion would be. I mean, you're talking about an amphibious invasion of you know, larger than on any scale since Normandy, and that would be, you know, to an untested PLA. So that kind of thing, I think, could could be a real disaster for them. On the other hand, um, the whole idea that uh, winning without firing a shot, I think, you know, while that may be Sun Tzu's history, it's certainly not the history of the Communist Party of China, which fought uh, border conflicts, at least, and wars um, with, you know, in, in the 20th century, the United States and the United Nations and Korea, with India, with the USSR, with Vietnam, and certainly all kinds of little incursions and crises with Taiwan. So, um, you know, it's it, I think it's a, a a party that is quite explicit about building. I mean, they say this all the time. We're preparing to fight and win wars. You know, everything must be um, you know ordered towards you know battle readiness and the ability to fight and win wars. You also have a sort of popular um, militant nationalism that's been stoked um, by the party. I think in in a lot of popular media and that sort of thing. So, um, I'd be much more concerned that, um, that, that we wind up with this concept that China doesn't want to fight a war, whereas I think the real truth is they don't want to fight a war that they would lose. And then there's the whole idea of what does it actually mean to lose, because that means something very different in, uh, to the Communist Party of China, which you know, says that they won the Korean War, says that they won um, the, the you know, border war with Vietnam in 1979, where they thought, where they lost uh, 30,000 soldiers. And, you know, we uh, did fight um, a war with China and Korea when we were the ones with nuclear weapons, not China. And of course, that was under the, the sort of US, um, USSR situation. But, but I think that, you know, Chinese nuclear doctrine and, and, and war fighting doctrine in general includes some really disturbing concepts such as war control, uh, seizing, you know, turning crisis into opportunity. I mean, all these sorts of things. So when you look at, um, you know, their sort of sense of, of uh, second strike and just nuclear defensive capability as something that underpins an offensive conventional capability uh, where they believe that they are being defensive by doing what they're doing in the South China Sea or in the East China Sea or in Taiwan. I, I think, I think we, it's very easy for us to misread each other by um, reading this the way that you know, Kennedy and Khrushchev could ultimately, for better or worse, uh, come to to an understanding that, um, that that you know there was there was shared Armageddon. I think the um, the conventional balance in the Pacific is is uh, it would be very very dangerous if that were to really and fully turn against the U.S. and our allies because I think to that the party that might represent a window of opportunity for them. So we have to maintain yeah. deterrence in the conventional realm, and, you know, regardless of 
Um, yeah, I, I, maybe we can get to this later. I, it's a. Can I, can I, Jonathan? I mean, Richard, just make a footnote on that. That's it's yeah, a really yeah, big yeah. question. I think they used to ask me, you know, what kept me awake at night. I'd say Afghanistan, uh, uh, Pakistan, and India because they both had nuclear weapons and been to war three times. I moved Taiwan to the top of my list, and I worry about it. Uh, Jonathan's point needs to be underscored. They're not going to wage a war that they're not convinced they're going to win. But if you're following careful, I mean, as Jonathan is, I'm sure, the, the writings out of the United States would suggest two things, that they could win, you know? That's what you're reading. And the second is, you know, uh, a doubt about whether we would intervene. So I think the Chinese might get quicker to a conclusion that they can win it than the reality would permit. And this is where the problem is. In history, the problem is a miscalculation. Yes. When you think the other side is in some place and you're in another, the missile crisis, you can go on and on. And where intelligence, this is where intelligence plays a key role, no matter how one feels about it. The ability to separate that and to know, to know, not theorize, know what the plans and intentions are so that you can get, you can hit a button. And there's a good example in my book about almost going to war during the Reagan period because of mis, uh, miscalculation, but it gets straightened out quickly and luckily. So I think this is, when we talk about this is going to be a war, you would say no, but there are some troublesome, very troublesome things, as Jonathan points out. And I worry about the miscalculation and the misunderstanding, how we accidentally contribute to it. And I want to, you know, I'm very hopeful that we are up to the game on the intelligence front. And I just make one last point, I'll leave it there. We Americans underestimate our power. I mean, both soft and hard. I mean, just because of our nature. So I, I think people should be so quick to run that, oh, you know, we couldn't win that. I mean, it depends on what cost and how. Don't underestimate just how powerful we are. And again, at some point, we should talk about the soft power. We've got a lot of cachet around the world that the Chinese don't have, no matter what you think politically and domestically at home. We are very powerful, much more powerful than we care to accept. And, you know, it's an asset. I want that reserve. I don't want us to be the bullies on the block. Well, you know, I, and thanks, Jack. I, I know, uh, uh, speaking of that area, and I, by the way, I want to get to Afghanistan, but let me, a couple of things on China. First, before we do, because we're, we're kind of running out of time here, uh, I know there's a lot of questions from the audience, but I do want to ask a couple of quick questions. Uh, you know, I, the, the Thucydides trap is the, uh, the you know, the, uh, the idea that a, countries go to war, a rising, a rising the, the dominant power tends to go to war with a rising power to prevent it from going up. And it's interesting that, that China now has a Navy that's larger than the United States Navy. I mean, it's structured differently, but um, you know, I, it's, it's China is becoming very assertive. And I wanted to ask you, though, Jonathan, about the wolf warriors, wolf warrior diplomacy. In other words, you know that China they're they're giving out loans and all these kinds of things that, that seem very magnanimous, but in fact, they're coming. Um, they're they're they come back with a vengeance if they don't uh, get what they want. For example, and I think the prime example was Sri Lanka with Haban Totem uh, Tota Port, where uh, this is the, they paid millions for this port. The, the Indonesians, there was I mean the uh, Sri Lankans, there was corruption involved. There was, uh, but but they couldn't pay the debt, and as a result, had to lease back that port and fifteen thousand acres around it for uh, for ninety nine years. And so China has this huge foothold into the area. Now, are, are countries around the world starting to wise up that China plays hardball? And if, if you want to play with, with China, you be, better be prepared. Not only is it, is it corrupting, but there's an invasive uh, uh, part of China. Are, are, we, uh, are we seeing this, uh, that they're wising up, or is it, are they just, is it too attractive for these projects? These, the money that comes. I, I mean, you've raised several important issues, all of which we could spend a lot of time on here. But I, I think that um, you know, countries that are receiving Belt and Road loans or projects, I mean, they're totally overmatched economically by China. I mean, you're talking about him, Bentota in Sri Lanka um, with the 99 year lease. I mean, there's just no way that you can have a, a sort of fair negotiation between Sri Lanka and China, really. And that's certainly how, um, you know, 
China looks at all these things. I mean, they're going out there and they're making essentially government to government deals. They're bringing in their own people, their own resources. I mean, that's alienating populations from Peru to uh, Kenya when it comes to um, project building around the world. And, and, and I think above all, it's, uh, it, it shows us that the contest here with China, I mean, it's gonna be in every dom domains we don't even think of as domains, but you know, one of them is, is gonna be the geographies of the, of the developing world. I mean, we're going to need um, you know, the development needs of, of Asia, of Africa, of Latin America. I mean, this is, um, these are all places where the United States is gonna to have to find a way to be a partner um, to, to all kinds of countries out there that basically have their options as essentially the World Bank or China. And China's, you know, giving them terms that uh, are, you know, that they're signing on to regularly. So, so I think we need a, a, a very big strategy for economic engagement in the emerging world. And we need to do that um, not solely as the U.S. government, but, um, you know, with our private banks and private corporations. I mean, that's where you really need the, um, the sort of uh, government and, and private sector to come together to solve strategic issues, which really hasn't happened. Um, I mean, I think that that's the, the, the real answer to, to a lot of U.S.-China competition is make sure you win the economic competition globally, um, start to cut uh, the Communist Party, you know, cut Beijing off from um, the, the advanced technologies of the West, uh, from financing from the West, and then go and play the game in the emerging world in terms of uh, diplomacy, economic engagement, um, and, and everything else that needs to go along with that. So you ultimately roll them back to a, a sort of regional power and, and, and less of a, uh, a global power. Um, but, you know, all, Ham Man Toad is an example of that. And Wolf Warrior, for those that don't know, I mean, it derives from a movie that uh, called Wolf Warrior. There's Wolf Warrior 1 and 2. And it was the most popular movie at the time in history in a single market other than Avatar and Titanic. And yet very few of us have, have seen, uh, seen it. And I featured it in China's Vision of Victory because it was sort of novel at the time. And uh, you know, it's basically an unnamed, um, what would you call it? It's Chinese special forces unit in an unnamed African uh, country fighting uh, Western you know, mercenaries. And the tagline is, uh, which means those who offend our China must be executed, even if they are far away. Very popular movie. So, um, you know, and now China's diplomats are uh, known as wolf warriors, which uh, I believe is, makes them popular at home, but uh, not so popular abroad. Well, um, quoting one of the great philosophers, a wolf sometimes is a wolf. <laughs> right, <laughs> exactly. My point, my yeah. point is, uh, yes. you know, they may come in sheep's yeah. clothing, but everybody knows they're a wolf. There's no, so when you're sitting there and you're in a, yep. you know, a corrupt situation, well, we'll take the money. Let's, how much do you want? I'll cut it five ways. I think much of what they're doing will turn out to be ephemeral and more fragile uh, than, than it appears. That doesn't step away from Jonathan's point that they're in there playing, so let's not fall asleep at the switch. But they have a hard sell, and that's what I was saying earlier, that you know, they're going to have a harder time finding allies than we have historically in history. And it's one of the big advantages we had against the Russians in the run-up against the Russians. Most of the world, all the neutral countries were with us. They were helping us tap their phones. You know, the Russians had a tough game to play once they left their territory. And I think at the end, of, when we come to the end of the conclusion of all this energy and money spent by the Chinese, I don't think they're going to, they're not going to find those loyalties where the local governments are actually going to be really in, uh, working with them and they're going to turn to the Western, different Western allies for, for meaningful relationships, particularly in the intelligence world. Well, I, I hope that's the case. And, you know, I had many other questions, but uh, well, there's, there's lots of questions from our audience. So uh, if you all don't mind, I'm going to turn it over to Rick Putnam, our, uh, our co-chair of the programs committee. A vice chair, and uh, he, I know he has lots of questions from the audience. So uh, let's continue the discussion. Thank you. Thank, thank you, Richard, and uh, fascinating discussion so far, Jack and Jonathan. Thank you. We've got a number of uh, pretty direct questions from the audience here, so I'll just uh, run through them uh, somewhat verbatim, and um, and and please both of you uh, respond. Um, one of the first is, um, you know, upon a further incursion or, or invasion of Ukraine by Russia, will the US and perhaps the European Union respond militarily? Well, let me, uh, let me respond. Uh, I pay close attention to Ukraine. I was out there in 2018. Um, and uh, a trip there 
really helps solidify your thinking of just how much it's like a, a Berlin situation. This is where the action is now between the United States and, and, and Russia. It, it's his number, it's Putin's number one sort of geopolitical aim. I'm not sure it's our number one, but there's a lot of his history in America about Ukrainian Americans. There's uh, the role of Ukraine in the history of Russia. The Ukrainians, I mean, the Western part of Ukraine hate Russians. I mean, there's the history. And there are many in the Eastern part that have Rus Russian ethnicity. So it will not be pretty. I mean, I'm, I'm just saying if the Russians go in, it's not gonna be a cakewalk. Uh, they're, they're gonna find massive resistance. You know, it's like they would have to use such a heavy hand that it would be so repulsive in the West. I mean, I think it's a game changer. Now, the question is you don't want to wait to the last minute. I mean, Putin is, you know, uh, saber rattling today along the border. He's going to pull the troops back. It turns out he pulled a few thousand out. Um, you know, he's a, he's, a, he's a risk taker. People really need to understand this. And this is where you have that miscalculation when you have a high risk taker. So I think when they went in and took the Crimea and Ukraine, our, our response was, you know, if that's the exemplar, then Putin's going to be more tempted to uh, to be to possibly send green men again. But I, I tell you, will not be pretty. And what are we going to do? So when they went in in eighteen, um, you know, we we provided non lethal support. Um, it was a lethal situation. And so I think I think that was a mistake. I think we should have been in there. We should not have American troops, let me get clear, but this is where we should have been toughening up that military to make the occupation of, of Western Ukraine an impossibility. So I'm not in the defense war planning or in the White House, but I think we need to look really carefully. And again, Jonathan points out, we were distracted by so many things, but we can't be distracted now. It's pretty pretty obvious of, of what's going on here. And that's why, you know, and I keep coming back to, to Richard's point about, you know, the Russians are a bit player. Well, bit player, look what they're, look what they're about to do. So the record doesn't show a bit player. So it remains to be seen. I. Okay, well, I think I, I think we're going to move quick. The question is, you have to have the plumbing in, and I, I'm not convinced we've got the plumbing in. It sounds like sounds like a yes um, in a without without troops on the ground, but but with the plumbing. Jonathan, that's, brief, that's my view. Very very similar question to you. Um, you know, if if China actually believes or miscalculates that it can invade Taiwan and commences some sort of action. Does the, does the US and its allies respond militarily? Well, I, I think it's a question that is um, an odd one to answer on the record. I mean, it's just, I think the important thing here is, um, uh, you know, uh, uh, some, some great analysts. I mean, Elbridge Colby uh, had, had a, some commentary on this this week where the key thing is for the Pentagon to be ready. And it's not what we say, it's what we're able to do. And, um, you know, I think for, for the US DOD to be absolutely focused on, I mean, that's what deterrence is. It's what you're capable. It's, it's the enemy understanding. I mean, as they say, deterrence is in the mind of the beholder. My worry would be something like uh, the example that I keep thinking of is Gamal Abdel Nasser in the 1967 war with Israel, where the Arab nations got together to attack Israel in the Six Day War. And there's this famous photo of Nasser talking to a journalist and he says, my generals tell me we will win. What would you do? Um, and, and then the next thing is his field marshals waving his pistol around drunk because they're being routed and all of that. And, and I think that the danger here is for, um, you know, for, for the Communist Party of China or for Moscow to, to think that they have carte blanche uh, to go in and, and, and carry out their wildest sort of military fantasies in each respective region. And I think we just have to be laser focused on showing that they will hit a very serious wall uh, not a wall of words, but um, that, that the capability is absolutely there. That's what we need to develop. That's why there's so much attention to Pacific um, defense and, and European defense um, you know, by Congress at this point. And um, Taiwan's ability to defend itself um, as you know, is gonna be central to that. And I think allied coordination um, on whatever contingency will, will be necessary. As Jack says, the plumbing is, is essential. 
Um, and then the other thing is, I think this is where the Russia-China relationship is really uh, worth reminding ourselves of the, you know, the, the sort of conceptual or at least um, circumstantial coordination here. I mean, this all really began in my mind in about 2014 when, as Putin was in, you know, annexing the Crimea, um, China was moving an oil rig into Vietnamese EEZs. And then um, the next thing was, was the island building in the South China Sea. So we've seen them sort of, um, you know, we've talked a bit about US distraction in this broader picture, but, you know, when Russia's doing one thing and China's doing the other, and the two are both simultaneously pushing against the boundaries of US and allied defense in Asia and um, Europe. And I think that um, the more that we're coordinated um, among our allies from Europe to the Pacific, even to the Middle East, on the nature of this problem, you know, the easier it's going to be, I think, to, to um, you know, mount that sort of uh, uh, deterrence in, 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 either, in either case and make sure that what you really want is just on no day do you want Moscow or Beijing to think it's a good idea to go ahead and, and, and take military action. Right. I'm going to add a quick footnote, and that is, if either of those events happen, to some degree we fail. In other words, if, if, right. if, they, if they go in, it's because they believe that we will not support them and we don't have the capability to support. So this is why what we do now will have a great bearing on the outcome. And I think the, the war planners and the policymakers need to understand you know, what Jonathan's talking about and what I'm saying. There's a big risk by strategic patience, if you will, on, on, on this type of uh, event. So I want to also say this is why intelligence is so important. You want to know that they're planning this and you want to know what their strategies are so you can pick up and calibrate the speed with which you're turning. So there's a big weight on the shoulders of the intelligence community to stop that, that intelligence failure. And it's one you're not going to unwrap. In other words, once they move against Taiwan or Ukraine, you now have a major, major world changing event in either place. Right. So, so that Russia, China coordination, I think leads to the and in your in your discussion there leads to a, another pointed question from from one of our listeners um, uh, to to Jack. Uh, your your prediction that at some point, perhaps by twenty thirty four, Russia will be. A, I did it to myself. I did it to myself. There's no, there's no the way. <laughs> do you mean do you mean in in a sense against China? Well, no, I didn't go that far. That's th that's twenty thirty six. But I think there's a natural reason for Russia and, and, and the U.S. and Western Europe to be, to be uh, economically, culturally aligned, right? What you have is an anomaly with a person whose formation, that psychological formation, wants to stay in a Cold War. Who wants to stay in a Cold War? I mean, I, you know, that's how I earned my spurs, if you will, in the Cold War. But I know that's not where we want to be. So I think over time, and that means post-Putin, however that comes about, I think Russia come, comes back. I understood. And then your question is, what does that mean for China? And I think the trajectory that Jonathan lays out so articulately is we're headed in a bad direction, which will impact both on Russia and the US. And it, in that scenario, you know, we're, we want to make sure that Russia and Russia will be sure that they're in our camp. But then I just, your last point is tied to all of this, how we behave, how we plan, the plumbing, the strategy, the intelligence is all integral for the people that are going to be around in the next 20 years. Right. So let's go return back to Jonathan for a moment. Another question from the audience is, you know, uh, the national debt in China, uh, Jonathan, and all the projects they have going on, BRI, um, they've got a, you know, a demographic bomb looking, you know, domestically looking at them. They've got a military buildup. Um, can they really afford all of this? And what is the implications, you know, financially for them over the, you know, over the medium to long term? Well, I think they can only afford all of this as long as we are funding them. And that's the first thing that I would want to change in U.S. policy is, is essentially ending, um, restricting, but essentially terminating investment into China particularly in strategic industries, um, civil military fusion, human rights abuses. I mean, the way that our banks and companies are getting more and more tied into, you know, an increasingly totalitarian state that's, you know, creating a military buildup that's ultimately designed uh, for combat with us. Um, it just doesn't make any sense for us to be doing that anymore. 
And, um, you know, that, that is why they can sustain this, this picture. I mean, if China were left on its own without that sort of funding, um, they would be dealing with all kinds of issues. The demographics, you know, mind you, don't kick in really until the 2030s. So they've got a good 10-year uh, run here. Um, where they can be sort of expansionary and they, they've got an enormous amount of national wealth built up that can go abroad. I mean, they're tied into all sorts of, um, you know, sort of resource acquisitions and, and trading relationships. I mean, it's absolutely positively global. But um, I think that their debt problems, their, um, you know, internal structural economic difficulties would catch up with them much, much faster if we weren't pouring capital in from New York and London uh, every single day. So, um, you know, that's a big part. I mean, we're funding the arms race against ourselves. We have been for quite a while, but we've gone past supply chain basing in China. We've even gone past China's a big market. Let's sell Nikes and, and Coca-Cola. Yeah. We've now gone into China's major companies are rising. Let's invest in them as, as, as stocks. And, you know, we should be doing that. Very, very interesting. I know we're coming to the end here, but I, and we've got so many wonderful questions. I want to ask one more, perhaps bridging both uh, you know, China's ambitions and, and intelligence. And that comes from a listener who asks about the recent deployment of a Chinese uh, space station or plans to, for, for scientific reasons. Um, is, this a, is this a wolf in, in sheep's clothing perhaps for, uh, for intelligence gathering? And I'll leave it to, to Jonathan and, and then to Jack to, to, to wrap up. Right, Jonathan. Sure. Um, there's, it's, it's a great question. I saw that one. I mean, it's, you know, on one hand, I think we, the, the Chinese military controls the Chinese space program. So ultimately, you know, scientific research is, is, you know, if there's anything of any military value, it would, it would be brought to the, the PLA. I mean, civil military fusions, another dimension of that, but their space programs are, um, you know, military and scientific. Um, but there was a quote I was looking for in Vision of Victory, which has the, the I believe it's the director of China's uh, moon mission program saying that he compares the, the moon and Mars to the East and South China seas. And he says, you know, we must go there because we can, we must control, you know, these places, uh, otherwise our ancestors won't forgive us. And it's just, it's, you can just see the sort of, uh, uh, how would you put it, just a range of their vision where um, all under one used to say Tian Sha, everything under the sky, but even the sky itself appears to be part of, uh, of their ambitions. So, so yes, I wouldn't treat any of that as benign. Um, their interest in, in you know, their recognition of space as a, an essential domain to conflict with the United States is, is also something that it should uh, worry us. Jack, any final thoughts, Jack, on that? No, I think, uh... I think I would sum it up. Any opportunity they have to collect intelligence, whether it's in cyber, space, human, which was not something, human intelligence was not something they were very good or very invested, that's changing. So they're a major power. So they're now using all the tools of major power. So every move has, you know, it's a, it's a thoughtful, calculated move to enhance, you know, military and economic power. So I think Jonathan's you know, spot on. Can't stop them. <laughs> space is free. Go get it. You know, we need to be strong. We need to make sure that our space program, our intelligence programs. You know, so how do you stop people from taking risks? America needs to maintain its strength. And I'm let me finish on this. I believe America has great great strength, much more than it's uh, recognized for even internally. And you know, there's I, I'm not I'm betting against the Chinese being the number one uh, number one power between now and 2030 at two. Great, excellent, excellent point to wrap up on. I wanna thank uh, uh, Jack Yu and, and Jonathan and, and Richard for his moderating and uh, I'll now turn it over to our chair, Nora Valenzuela for closing, thank you. You're on